Okay. All right. well, well, good morning. My name is Randall Jones, and I'm a distinguished fellow at KEI. And today we're going to have a discussion about the OECD uh, Korea Economic Survey uh, for 2022. It was published just last week uh, on the 19th of September. But today we have the OECD Korea team with us. Who I'll briefly introduce. We have Jan Perlison, who's the senior economist and head of the Korea Sweden desk. And he joined the OECD in 2011. And he's worked on the United Kingdom, Sweden, Estonia, Finland, and the Euro area. And now he gets to do Korea. Uh, we have uh, Hyun Jung Hwang, who joined the OECD in 2015. And she's also worked on Finland, Sweden, as well as China and uh, other um, cross country projects. And prior to the OECD, she was at Sciences Po in Paris. And then we have Yun Yang Yang, who joined the OECD just uh, four months ago. And so she's on leave for the Ministry of Economy and Finance. And I think she joined uh, MOEF in 2006, where she's done uh, a very wide range of uh, projects for, uh, for the government. Um, full disclosure, I should say that I spent 30 years at OECD. And before leaving OECD, I wrote 16 economic surveys of Korea. So this is a monumental task, uh, very time staking, involves two trips to Korea, uh, meetings with the government, with the labor unions, with business, academics, think tanks. And so it really is a major project and it's a very uh, important piece of information for the government. So today we're going to uh, start with um, a presentation of the survey by the Korea team. And then afterwards we'll have time for discussion. I encourage the audience to use the um, the YouTube chat function to pose any questions or comments that they may have. And uh, so the floor is, uh, is yours. Thank you, Randall. I will, um, I will start sharing my screen. Just one sec here. There. Yes, so uh, thanks a lot for, um, for, for, for hosting us to the KEI. And, um, and um, yes, so we are the Korea desk and uh, we monitor the Korean economy uh, with the economic survey as the highlight every two years. And the survey was written by Hanjong Huang and me, both here present, and Randall Jones, not the least, uh, the living legend. Um, is also here, and um, who wrote the chapter, wrote the chapter, and we also had substantial con contributions from Vincent Kuhn, uh, Yun Yong Yang, here as well, and also Axel Pervin. So uh, we can uh, distribute uh, login details so that all of you can uh, can download the full report from our I library. Uh, we'll, we will make sure this happens afterwards, and and that will give you access not only to this report but also to pretty much all OECD publications and most of our data. So so that should be a a boon for those of you who are interested. So with this introduction, I will leave the floor to my colleague Hyun Jung Wang. Thank you. Firstly, um, I'd like to give a brief overview of our presentation. So I'll begin by presenting a Korea's macroeconomic um, situation. After that, you will be uh, looking green policies and productivity gaps, and then I'll end with social safety issues in Korea. So let me start with Korea's macroeconomic issues. Um, Korea has experienced very rapid economic development over the past decades, and in 2020, GDP per capita surpassed the OECD average for the first time. In the next slide, please. So in 2020, Korea experienced only a shallow recession. This is mainly thanks to its very capable management of the COVID crisis. But Korea was able to contain the pandemic without a national lack lockdown, unlike most other OECD countries, which led to a relatively limited disruptions to the economy. And then the economy rebounded rapidly in 2021, and this was partly driven by strong external demand on Korea's key export items like semiconductors. 
So the continue uh, the recovery continued um, into 2022. Uh, the labor market has recovered and un unemployment has already normalized and total employment also surpassed pre-pandemic level. But at the same time, inflation has risen fast in 2022. Despite a slight decrease in August, headline consumer price inflation remained almost triple the 2% inflation target, which hovered around 6%, and reflecting persistent underlying pressures, including from supply bottlenecks and recovering consumption. And core inflation, um, excluding food and energy, continued to increase, reaching around 4%, reflecting a broadening inflation pressures. So now the recovery is slowing and after a strong rebound by around 4% last year, real GDP is projected to grow less than 3% this year and slightly above 2% next year. And inflation is set to remain elevated, which will erode households' real disposable income, dragging the recovery of private consumption. Then what should Korea do to support a resilient recovery? First, first thing, uh, firstly about monetary policy. So Bank of Korea has increased key policy rates in, in August last year to the current 2.5%. And the preemptive moves have helped keep inflation expectations anchored and nominal wage increases modest so far. However, um, as you can see in the panel B of this chart, year ahead inflation expectations have increased lately and upward pressures on nominal wages is expected to mount at the labor market cycle. Also recently, real effective exchange rate is declining uh, the previous time, yes. Um, and this largely reflects a relatively strengthening of the US dollar. So um, in overall, monetary policy should continue to move towards a less accommodative stance. And this is very important to keep inflation expectations in check and prevent price wage spiral, which drives higher inflation. About fiscal response. Um, fiscal response during the pandemic was swift and appropriate, which could support household income during the pandemic. Um, according to Statistics Korea, household disposable income increased quite significantly for all income groups in 2022, thanks to the, the fiscal support. But now, uh, given the rising inflation um, and also the, the, um, the increasing public spending uh, expenditures ahead, fiscal support should be scaled back and help the central bank contain inflation. And this requires shifting the support from broad-based crisis support towards more targeted support. So it means that it's very important to deliver maximum relief to those vulnerable to rising living costs of the current um, stage. And going forward, a credible fiscal framework to ensure long-term sustainability needs to in place, given spending pressures are at. Currently, government debt remains relatively low in international comparison, but going forward, population, population aging is relatively rapid in Korea, which is expected to put high spending pressures in the long term, especially through higher demand on healthcare and pension. And the government, the new, the current government uh, plans to establish a long-term fiscal plan with concrete actions and propose a new fiscal rule that is more stringent than the proposal of the previous government. And this is uh, welcome. But uh, implementing these planned reforms would be essential to, to stabilize that. So this is a summary of our recommendations that I already mentioned. And from now on, Yon will um, discuss how to reach greenhouse gas emission targets. So, uh, so this is actually, um, this photo was actually one I took in, in Sejong on a beautiful morning with, with beautiful morning mist, but uh, 
you can mistake it for smog. So, so I thought it was a nice, uh, nice illustration about uh, environmental issues, even though it's, it's, it's a total fake. Sorry for that. Um, Korea has um, um, committed to reducing emissions by 40% from the 2018 level by 2030 and to net zero by 2050. And as you see from this figure, this will obviously necessitate some bold policy actions going forward. And uh, it will have a considerable cost, which should be minimized by implementing as efficient policies as possible. Korea's manufacturing, exporting sector, and electricity generation are emission intensive, pointing to a challenging transition. However, it's not so one-sided because it also leaves room for relatively low cost emission reductions with considerable coal benefits from cleaner air because some of those fairly low cost uh, options to reduce emissions uh, like facing down coal has uh, have, have already been done in other countries so uh, so the marginal cost in korea may, may not be as high as in some other early movers korea's emission trading scheme the kets was the first in east asia and should be recognized by policymakers as the best tool to reduce emissions as much as possible at the lowest possible cost. The KETS puts a price on carbon from large share of emissions, but too many allowances are handed out for free and its overall emission limit is not yet aligned with the new and more ambitious emission reduction targets. And also a very important point is that deregulation is needed to allow the carbon price to pass through to electricity production to actually incentivize emission reduction in this um, important sector. On a sort of more positive note, the political economy of climate policies is often difficult and politicians have found it very difficult in many countries to do anything seen as raising energy costs to ordinary people. But the new OECD research shows that there is a silver lining if these revenues are linked to support low carbon technologies and low carbon infrastructure. So, uh, so these are our um, recommendations which, which are basically uh, about fully utilizing the, um, the potential uh, that is there already in the Korea emissions trading scheme, which is a sort of uh, under communicated perhaps and also underused uh, policy in Korea when you ask when you ask people when you are they tend to sort of mention every other policy before they even recognize or remember that, that they have an emissions trading scheme. It should be the other way around. So uh, we, as already mentioned, we hired Randall to write an excellent chapter on how to increase youth employment. Uh, and uh, I will leave it to him to, to talk about this at another occasion. But uh, there are a few points uh, he has elaborated in this chapter that have a wider relevance. So I just want to mention this briefly. Many of Korea's structural challenges can only be properly understood in the context of productivity gaps and also labor market dualism. So export-led growth and the nurturing of large exporting companies was an important part of Korea's growth strategy, but it led the ground for considerable and also persistent productivity gaps to smaller companies. So this graph from, again, from Randall's chapter, um, it shows on the horizontal axis, it shows um, variation in productivity between companies. And on the vertical axis, it shows variation is in um, wages between companies. And you see that, that Korea has very high variation on both those counts. And, and a lot of research shows that, that uh, this kind of productivity and variation often um, drives inequalities in many countries. So large firms, they offer 
typically highly educated workers, well-paid jobs, good working conditions, regular employment, and social insurance coverage. But their share of employment has fallen as production has been automated and moved offshore. While on the other hand, low productivity SMEs, they hire a larger share of non-regular workers who not only earn less, but they also are less protected. They have a lower share are covered by employment insurance, national health insurance, national pension scheme, uh, bonus payments and company pensions, and very few are unionized. These firms find it hard to attract the skilled workers they need to boost productivity, for example, by adopting digital technologies. So this, this is also from, from Randall's chapter, this graph. Uh, this one is not. Um, it is uh, our product market regulations indicator. So it's basically, it says something about how cumbersome regulations are and, and the higher the bar, the more cumbersome. And you see Korea is, is, has a fairly high bar. So um, a large number of policies have been put in place to support SMEs, including subsidies, favorable access to public procurement, regulations differentiated by company size, and even whole market segments reserved for SMEs. So each policy may have some justification if you see it in isolation, but they sum up to a system that supports the survival of low productivity firms against a backdrop of regulatory, regulatory complexity. So, so we would rather favor less regulation, more competition for this sector. And these gaps have a number of negative consequences. John will talk about how they are reflected in the social safety net gaps. They are also a root cause of the issues facing youth analyzed by Randall in his chapter. We have named this issue the golden ticket syndrome. Uh, it's because uh, we sort of point to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, where if you open a chocolate with a golden ticket inside the wrapping, you can achieve great success. You basically win. And the more chocolates you buy, of course, the larger your chances are to, to win. So when facing these gaps in income and social protection, Korean youth struggle to win a golden ticket for the good jobs that can support a family and a good life. And this is, of course, through scoring highly on university entrance exams. So you get into a good university, which will in turn help you to get a job at a large company or in the public sector. So you have your in for a treat when Randall chooses to, to um, to uh, present this chapter for you. Um, another negative effect is that it increases the cost of motherhood in several ways, including, including the direct cost to help their offspring win a golden ticket and the cost in terms of lost career, which is shown here in this graph, uh, where the red line um, is, um, is the employment gap to men of Korean mothers. Over the past few decades, education and access to jobs have become increasingly equal between genders. The, the large-scale rollout of publicly, publicly funded daycare and kindergartens has raised enro enrollment rates to the level of Nordic countries, which is a, a great achievement. But working life and social norms have not kept pace. So combining career and children is often not an option when you face norms and expectations based on traditional gender roles and long working hours and limited flexibility in the workplace. And these mothers returning to working life tend to find that only these low paid non-regular jobs in low productivity SMEs are available. <clears throat> Young women therefore postpone family formation and have fewer children over their lifetime. And this has put Korea on the path to rapid aging, which will lead to fiscal and labor market pressures going forward. So these are our recommendations. I'll let you study uh, more later, but I think this increasing competition uh, in the SME sector is, uh, is a key recommendation here. And, um, and I think also getting rid of those, uh, those um, 
those obstacles you can get rid of for, for female uh, or mother's employment uh, is important. And, and the norm in the OECD is, is that the government takes the bill for, for maternal leave. So, uh, so we recommend that Korea should move in this direction as well. All right, then it's back to John to present her chapter on the social safety net. Um, great. About the strengthening social safety net uh, chapter. So um, despite its rapid economic development, Korea still has relatively high poverty rates, especially for the old. Next slide, please. And uh, gaps in income and social protection between regular and non-regular workers are large. Previous slide. This largely reflects incomplete social safety net for both working age population and the older population. So um, the COVID crisis has further highlighted the importance of ensuring adequate social protection. So against this background, this chapter um, of the survey explored ways to improve the social safety net for both working age population and the old age population. Next slide, yes. Um, so let me start with the working age social safety net. A major weakness of, it, of uh, the social safety net for the working age population is its low coverage of employment insurance. So around half of the entire labor force in Korea does not have access to employment insurance. So they cannot get unemployment benefits when they lose jobs. Broadly, there are two reasons for the low coverage. One reason is that employment insurance is not compulsory for non-salaried workers like self-employed. Only, currently only 0.6% of the, the self-employed has, uh, has, has, um, has, has access to the unemployment benefits. And second reason is that a sizable share of employees do not contribute despite their legal obligation to do so. A second issue is a design of an employment benefit which reduces work incentives for low income workers. Currently, Korean employment insurance beneficiaries returning to a minimum wage job would lose by working. This is unique among OECD countries and can potentially trap employment insurance recipients in unemployment. So it significantly increases unemployment rates for the, for the um, workers, uh, the low income workers. This is because the unemployment benefit floor, which was linked to the minimum wage, have increased very rapidly as the minimum wage uh, increased quite rapidly over the past years. So now the unemployment benefit has almost converged to the ceiling, the maximum amount of the, of the unemployment benefit. And this is very unique among the OECD countries. And the pension system fails to secure adequate pension income for many seniors. Firstly, basic pension is low and not well targeted. Currently, the basic pension provides 300,000 300, Korean won per month, which is among the lowest in the OECD. But this basic pension is provided to nearly 70% of the elderly, which means that the basic pension in Korea is spread out very thinly over a large uh, share of the old population. Another issue is low pensions provided by the National Pension Service. This contribution-based pensions are mostly below the poverty line. And the low pension from the National Pension Service partly reflects low replacement rate. For instance, for a full career worker with an average wage, a net pension is only 31% of their net pre-retirement earnings, which is very low in international comparison. And another issue is the relatively short contribution period so in 2020, the contribution period was only 18 years for new pensioners. Besides pensions, there is also room for improvement in health and long-term care. Firstly, health care is not is unaffordable for many, despite the mandatory health care insurance with universal coverage. 
And this partially reflects that many poor elderly are not eligible for healthcare benefits because um, reflecting the so-called family obligation rule, which is a means test also taking into account the income of close family members. Second issue is on over-reliance on hospitals. Many recipients of long-term care are unnecessarily hospitalized to hospital. Many elder elderly who do not need hospitalization or medical care stay in hospitals. And this contributes to the fact that most of the long-term care spending goes to hospitals, unlike in any other OECD countries. Um, this leads to significant inefficient use of resources. This situation reflects a number of factors, one of which is using hospitals is more financially attractive for care recipients than using institutions for home care. Another factor is that there is a lack of accessible, affordable, and high quality long-term care home care services, reflecting low financial and human resources, especially home visiting nurses. So this is a list of our recommendations to strengthen the social safety nets. And one of the key recommendations to improve the situation is to, tech, is to um, increase the benefit level of basic pensions uh, while reducing the coverage. So we should better target those with the highest needs. And then contribution-based national pension should also be reformed by raising the pension eligibility age and increasing replacement rates. Also, another key recommendation to improve the uh, long-term care um, is harmonizing long-term care insurance and healthcare insurance reimbursement schemes um, so that uh, it doesn't incentivize the elderly to choose hospital care than home care or care from the, care in the, from the um, institution. This is the end of our presentation. Thank you. Of all the various uh, topics that were covered, and the recommendations I think are extremely important. Uh, in the next CREA survey, we will take a stock taking to see how many of these recommendations have been put in place, and I hope that uh, most, if not all, will have been uh, put in place by 2024. 20, uh, we do have one question from the audience that maybe we'll start with this. And it, the question is, to what extent does the banking finance system uh, provide capital efficiently to emerging mid and small cap enterprises? So I um, could you repeat the question? Sorry, I, I was too busy with uh, stopping my screen sharing. <laughs> <laughs> financing a small. Uh, to what extent is the bank and financial system able to efficiently uh, finance new companies and uh, startups? Uh, small. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, this is a question that we uh, i think we we struggle a bit with for all OECD countries um and i think uh, policy is often made on the premise that uh, that the banking system is not good enough to 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 uh, to extend finance to these smes and i think there are definitely there are definitely issues i mean there are issues with with upstarts who don't have a a um a history and record, and perhaps they don't have assets. And also, there's an issue with uh, with um, uh, intellectual intellectual property, which which is which you cannot collateralize. So, so I think that there are issues, and there is a room for policy intervention to address these issues. But uh, I think there's also a long way to go from these concrete issues to to sort of uh, justify the large scale intervention in financial provision to to SMEs. Yeah, I think that finance um, to capital market finance. So they've made many efforts to. 
I have problems hearing you. Yeah, same here. Is that better? Yes. So um, I was agreeing with you <laughs> that uh, I think that uh, system towards a capital-based finance system uh, try to foster venture investment. And I think they've had made great strides, but the investment in Korea has risen dramatically. But still, the government, as you mentioned, uh, large amount of credit guarantees to help the, uh, the SME sector. And the problem is that favor uh, non-viable companies, helping them survive, rather than the efficient startup ones. So I, I think that's a big improvement that the SME sector a driver of growth. If you look at the past presidents, um, Park geun wanted to be the SME president. Uh, Moon Jae-in wanted to make SMEs a driver. So it's really a preoccupation. Uh, I think there is still some issues with the sound. I'm not sure if it's the if it's the receiver or or I think. Mm. Anyway, no. Um, yeah, I, I think you know the get increasing productivity in SMEs is is I mean it's. it's it's extremely important for the Korean economy because they are such a such a large share and they are so so far behind in productivity. So if you could only some conversions yeah. uh, towards uh, high productive uh, larger companies would be uh, would be an enormous gain for uh, for Korean society, uh, both sort of in terms of GDP, but also yeah. in terms of all these uh, these more sort of yeah. social issues that we mentioned now in the. In the in the um, in the presentation, but right. but I think I think sort of some supports are warranted, uh, which mm -hmm. which you yourself have have um, have um, concluded many times in 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 uh, in, in your sixteen surveys, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, but I think. Um, the, the big emphasis should be on on competition uh, in in this sector, and then you if, if you sort of if you feel you should that yeah, that you need to that there's something wrong that you need to correct with policy, I mean, then the burden of evidence should be on the government to actually make the case that that there is something wrong that you should correct, and uh, and I think often this is not the case. I mean, you just assume that that uh, that you need some supports, and, uh, and then you put some supports in place, and then after many years, um, there are many supports in place, many different ones. And that is sort of, uh, At one point, we counted 1,350 SME programs trying to provide a whole range of support, and it became a, a problem because small companies didn't want to grow SME status because then they would lose all the support. And other studies show that companies that do get perform uh, poorly, they have more uh, but less profitability. So it's a very difficult um, a way to make a target effect. And the comment is um, community medical insurance covers non regular workers' medical expenses almost the same as for re regular workers. So, <laughs> so, so the point is, um, so even non-regular workers, even if the company doesn't provide health insurance at the company, they still get it through their community, so they get equal treatment in that regard. Um, well, I, I, this question is not very clear to me, and perhaps... Um, mm -hmm. Young or Rendell can, uh, can reply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think they are covered. So you, Korea has a universal health insurance. Um, I think the key thing is um, how much they pay for premiums. So I think the uh, worker-based uh, health insurance would be less expensive. And it's also 
uh, mandatory. Nobody slips through the system, whereas with community-based uh, insurance, some people slip through. Uh, I think the key problem is um, is the out-of-pocket payments are so large that for people with chronic illness, um, they pay a large share, as you pointed out in that one slide. So I, I think there still is a problem, even though, in theory, 100% of the population should be covered by CREA. And CREA deserves credit because they established universal health care a long time ago, back in the 1980s, uh, when they're still a fairly low-income country. So I, I think CREA um, deserves great credit for doing this early on uh, to help welfare. We have a question about pension benefits. Um, how much should pension benefits be increased for people below the poverty line to minimize the impact of the forthcoming global recession on Korea? <laughs> a very pessimistic, pessimistic question, that the forthcoming recession. I think there, there's always a recession coming, so, <laughs> so that's, a, that's safe to assume. Right. I'll, let, I'll let John uh, answer the question. <laughs> Well, even doubling the current benefit mm -hmm. level would mm -hmm. not uh, may decrease the, the it would reduce the the poverty rate only by around uh, less than ten percent mm -hmm. percentage points, so which is still um, mm -hmm. not enough mm -hmm. to, to to address the high poverty rate. So um, it's very important, as I mentioned, it's very important mm -hmm. to to increase the, the benefit level significantly while reducing mm -hmm. the, the coverage of mm -hmm. the of the benefit. Right. I guess another uh, alternative would be to um, increase access to the basic livelihood uh, support program, a more general uh, social welfare benefit. And now that the uh, family obligation test has been removed, except for health care, maybe the elderly can rely on, on that to a larger extent as well. I think, I think the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the system as such, mm -hmm. system as a, the total system should mm -hmm. ensure that uh, the elderly receive adequate income mm -hmm. to so that they don't end up in poverty and i think this i think the government realizes this and they have set up this commission to to look at the uh, the, the pension system uh, mm -hmm. at, at the system level not mm -hmm. in its individual components mm -hmm. so i think we, we, we definitely support this even though we also point to some some concrete action they could take as part right. of this mm -hmm. big package is there any um, news on what actions they might take um, <laughs> from the new government, or is it too early to say how the pension system could uh, might be reformed? As far as I know, oh, sorry, Yung Yung. Um, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> as far as uh, as far as mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. the details about the new government's pension mm -hmm. reform are still not mm -hmm. um, available yet. Yeah, okay. even before the minister of yeah mm -hmm. minister ministry of welfare is not. Um, yeah, not um, appointed yet. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that the uh, the pension reform mm -hmm. um, direction will be released maybe next uh, early next year, mm -hmm. uh, according to the new government. All right. Mm -hmm. In my uh, point of view, I think the the key thing really is raising the contribution rate, because um, we yeah. started off with a replacement rate of seventy percent. So pensioners got seventy percent of pre retirement income. And then it went down to 60, down to 50, mm -hmm. down to 40. And so many people, I think, have lost confidence in the system that it won't be sustainable and it doesn't provide enough income. So I think this is really a, mm -hmm. a key problem for a rapidly aging economy like mm -hmm. Korea. Uh, there's another question, um, again, on elderly. It says, um, how many of the problems associated with the elderly population are likely to ease naturally over time as the current elderly pass on and the current middle age population starts to retire. In other words, can we wait for the problem to resolve itself <laughs> partly uh, I naturally? I don't think that's the case with mm -hmm. Korea. At least you have mm -hmm. to wait very, very long mm -hmm. because when you have the, the current fertility rate, I, that is mm -hmm. the number of children per woman on, on average is no, now uh, at 0 0.8, right. 0 0.81. It's been right. between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9 for three years now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, uh, so, so the demographic 
transition is is ongoing and and it won't it, it's not just some like in some other countries that you have a sort of the baby boomer generation and and this will sort of feed through and 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 um, and there will be some uh, some some issues for for a period of time. I mean, I think right. that period of time is much longer in, in Korea because right. uh, because uh, birth rates have been continuously falling. Right. I think uh, one maybe positive sign might be that um, right now the gap between the older generation and the young generation is huge in terms of their digital skills and uh, other areas. So uh, maybe the in generation in between, as they get elderly, uh, maybe they can work longer because they uh, will have better skills. And right now the honorary retirement age tends to be around 50, which leaves a lot of people in poverty and then they have very short contribution periods for pensions. So maybe this higher education level of the upcoming elderly generation might enable them to stay employed in their, their main career job longer. So that might be one positive element, but um, when you have a birth rate of 0 0.8, <laughs> things are very difficult. Yeah, of course, of course, utilizing the labor resources that are available is right. is of course key to handling this and and so uh, so so one thing is that that people keep their high productivity career jobs uh, right. for longer uh, yeah. and and also that uh, that women can can combine right. well of course men as well they can also combine family and children I'm, I'm sure men would also appreciate this but but it would allow women more women to work um, and also, and also youth, of course, that, uh, that youth, uh, uh, increasing youth employment. So I think there are many labor resources to draw on, and we also show this in some simulations for the survey. It's, it's right. a bit back of the envelope, but uh, mm -hmm. it shows that you can, uh, you can, uh, um, you can, um, at least to an extent, uh, avoid some of these pressures if mm -hmm. you, if you manage to utilize these resources. Right. We have a, another question. This is more about the, um, the outlook, and it's about the risk to the Korean economy in, uh, from the current difficult U.S.-China relationship. So what, what problems does this U.S.-China um, conflict or disagreement, does that endanger uh, the Korean economic outlook? Yeah, I, uh, yes. Uh, I mean, we are economists, and um, they, um, they. Some people say that Christopher Columbus was the first economist. He, um, he so when he went to discover America, he didn't know where he was going, right. <laughs> and when he was there, he didn't know where he was, right. and it was all on the government grant. Right. <laughs> so, so I think right. <laughs> asking us these these difficult questions is, is is a bit right. cruel. But I'll try to respond anyway. Um, right. Yes. Um, I, I think now the COVID crisis and, and, uh, and Russia's uh, war on Ukraine um, have shown us that, mm -hmm. uh, that the global value chains are vulnerable. And of course, Korea is highly dependent on global value chains mm -hmm. uh, with their manufacturing industries. This mm -hmm. is basically what, what, what has been driving Korea's right. success for, for, uh, for decades. Um, so, um, and, and now with the tensions uh, between the U.S. and China and, uh, and the crisis in the Taiwan Strait, uh, we are sort of inching closer to what some people call decoupling or, you know, French shoring, or you have many different names for it. Right. And, um, and what we say in the survey is that uh, Korea should be uh, prepared for these things. They, you should, they should... Um, they should have contingency plans. They should um, diversify their value chains, and um, and um, and also I think one issue that often comes up is uh, home shoring that uh, you produce everything right. at home. Yeah. I I understand why this comes up because uh, because it's sort of this sort of sounds like an easy fix, but but no country can ever produce everything at home it's simply not possible so it's not a robust solution um but uh, but definitely you know diversifying reducing dependence on china which we have discussed mm -hmm. a bit in 
in the survey. I think uh, I think this this is very important, and it has um, uh, it has become much much more important uh, in the past few years. I think um, looking at your forecast, uh, to me, it's quite an optimistic forecast. Uh, two point two point two. I think Bank of Korea's estimate of potential is down to two percent. So we have Korea above potential uh, through next year. And that includes, I think, some fiscal tightening because we've had, what, eight supplementary budgets since the uh, COVID uh, pandemic started. I think the last one was in June, and now there's no more in the pipeline, as I understand. And I think um, the spending for next year will be less than the spending this year, uh, assuming we don't have more supplementary budgets. So it seems like fiscal policy is being tightened somewhat. And nevertheless, the uh, economy is expected to grow more than 2%. So I, I think that's a favorable outlook, but there are many risks. What, what risks do you see to your, your positive outlook for next year? Um, well, well, there are several risks, and one of the main risks mm -hmm. to the Korean economy is elevated household debt, mm -hmm. um, which has increased rapidly over the, mm -hmm. over the past years. The problem is that most loans mm -hmm. are floating rates. Mm -hmm. um, this implies that household debt servicing burden is that that is set to increase mm -hmm. um, as interest rates rise. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, the the well the, the situation where interest rates need to rise fast um, or a potential price correction uh, could lead over leveraged household debt. Mm -hmm. uh, households to hold back their their mm -hmm. um, consumption quite significantly. So this mm -hmm. is a a main risk to the to the outlook of Korea. All right. Well, I think you still recommend that interest rates will probably have to go up further. I mean, the inflation rate can be from a we have a forecast of five point two this year for CPI headline, and I think three point nine next year, which looks very good. I mean. In my country, we're far away from that. So it seems like the Bank of Korea really uh, was uh, wise to start reacting early on. I guess last August was the first hike. But we, I think we still anticipate more hikes in the future. And the exchange rate, I guess, is a risk for inflation. Well, what we That's have assumed is, sorry, what we did assume is forecast was fairly gradual 0.25% mm -hmm. uh, steps. Mm -hmm. Uh, but only since we released the survey last Monday, si the situation has uh, changed a bit. The debate has changed a bit, and now it seems like uh, one or two uh, zero point five percent steps are increasingly likely. Mm -hmm. I think one one fifty basis point step uh, wouldn't really change our. Uh, Outlook that much, but of course, one and one more. Then you um, you're in, in a slightly different situation, and then you sort of trigger perhaps more of these um, issues with with household with household debt that uh, John uh, mentioned. Hmm. So um, so I think uh, it's um, it's true. I think uh, I think our forecast of uh, of 2.2 percent for next year has some downside. I think we are more confident in our sort of short-term forecast for this year. Uh, I think we already have a strong Q2 that will. will uh, so it's. I think growth has to be very weak in Q3 and Q4 um, to uh, to get very much below what we forecast. But next year, it's it's highly uncertain, and also with with everything going on in the world, I mean, so so many things could happen that we haven't really even even thought about yeah. in, in this forecast. So, uh, Jug mentioned the issue of housing prices, which in Korea, of course, is extremely sensitive, and we've seen the new government try to do um, a different approach by scaling back the um, the real estate, the comprehensive real estate tax as well as capital gains. Do you expect that will have a, a positive impact on um, stabilizing housing prices? Or what, what do you, do you favor this new approach to uh, uh, taxes? Well, in, in principle, um, reducing capital gain taxes mm -hmm. would help bring underutilized mm -hmm. um, housing to the market. So um, at least in the 
through them. So um, it, uh, it helps um, reduce housing prices. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, reducing the comprehensive real estate holding tax um, may have the opposite effect because it mm -hmm. reduces the cost of holding multiple homes mm -hmm. and may this may disincentivize right. um, mm -hmm. multiple home owners from mm -hmm. selling real estate. So it is unclear at this stage what the possible impact would be um, of this set of uh, measures mm -hmm. and on the housing prices. And also, as you mentioned, frequent, frequent um, policy changes uh, increase volatility mm -hmm. and, uh, and this new policies may not have the intended effect of household respect that the, the next administration will, will undo any changes. All right. I think the key really is on the supply side, trying to increase the supply of housing. And I think the UN administration has talked about the supply side as well, so, so maybe that will help. Just in the last few minutes, maybe we, we could talk about green growth, since Korea has um, really focused on that issue with very ambitious targets. I know when um, Moon Jae-in in, in uh, 2020 announced carbon neutrality and then the 40% nationally determined uh, contribution, I think it was 27% reduction, and he raised it to 40%. I know the business sector was very alarmed uh, by that. On the other hand, uh, environmental NGOs thought it should be 50%. <laughs> but do you think um, do you think to reach carbon neutrality by 2050, Korea has to reach this 40% uh, reduction by 2030? I, I think I think it's you. You can think of climate policy is often like, like a super tanker out at sea when you want to change the course. <laughs> so right. you, you, you sort of call the engine room and, you know, we want to change it from the bridge, change right. the course. Mm -hmm. And they and they sort of start with the rubber and, and with the engines, but it takes time. And it really takes a lot of time. So, um, so I think our focus is less on target achievement in 2030 and it's more about implementing the right policies and um, and I think um, uh, this achieving carbon neutrality uh, it will for, for many countries not just Korea it's mm -hmm. it's not uh, um, when people tell me that this is sort of super cheap dirt cheap it's free and perhaps you can even boost growth uh, beyond or boost, boost living standards beyond what they would be otherwise. I think to me that doesn't sound correct. I think there there are definitely big costs. There are some economic costs. There are big political costs, which we have many examples of. And because of this, it should be done in an efficient way. And um, mm -hmm. and this means carbon pricing. Mm -hmm. You should probably you should definitely do many other things as well. You know, subsidies, mm -hmm. some regulations that support the price signal. Mm -hmm. But uh, but carbon pricing needs to be part of the package otherwise you will have all this all these um uh all these sort of uh all these areas of the economy that simply fall through the cracks right. and you would have some uh, some very expensive things going on and some uh, some sectors not not doing anything so um and and korea has the emissions trading schemes which is already the infrastructure that they need but they, I mean, it's sometimes it sort of feels like they don't really take it seriously, mm -hmm. the innovation strategy scheme. Because, for example, in the electricity sector, when, when, when uh, it's decided from the day to day which facilities produce electricity, uh, it's not decided in the market, it's decided uh, by a formula. Mm -hmm. And in this formula, uh, up until recently, uh, the ETS price wasn't part of the formula at all. Mm -hmm. So that means that the ETS, uh, the carbon price, wasn't, it didn't give any, um, right. any signal to, to electricity production. Now this has changed, but the change is not so much better because now it's the actual cost incurred by companies, uh, by electricity producers mm -hmm. to to uh, to procure these credits, mm -hmm. and they receive most of them for free. I mean, they receive uh, at least ninety percent of these credits for free from the government. 
So, so that means that the real cost, the marginal cost on polluting is still not, uh, still not uh, reflected. Mm. So, so I think these are sort of very fundamental things that need to be fixed first. And then when you have done these things, you can start looking at what other things do we also need to do to, to back up the, this price signal and make it as efficient as possible. I guess in Korea's political system, uh, the ship might be turning now, but in five years we'll have a new president who might turn a different direction. So before we even get the impact of these changes, we might start off in a new direction. Uh, and of course, President Yoon has decided to go heavily into nuclear power, which uh, President Moon Jae-in wanted to phase out. So uh, it seems that uh, we have kind of have a new path. And uh, from my point of view, that's wise because I think the without nuclear, the share of renewables would be 60, 70 percent, which would not really be feasible in a country with uh, Korea's uh, geographic uh, conditions. But I think uh, another problem is I, for many Koreans, electricity prices are viewed as a tax as well. And it's extremely sensitive. And they were basically frozen electric pr electricity prices from 2013 to about 2022. And so on paper, people accept higher carbon prices. But electricity has been something that's been very hard to adjust. So I think it will take a lot of political will to try to uh, bring electricity prices into line. And President Yoon warned that the prices could have to go five times higher, which would be <laughs> a very big uh, shock uh, for Korean households uh, to see that kind of increase. I, I mean, I, I also I, I think this a bit of a misconception there because mm -hmm. um, when you look at the um, at the cost structure of uh, of um, producing electricity, the the carbon price is a little very very small. Uh, even even these days, when you have uh, the, the even in Europe in these days, when you have these yeah. enormous uh, increases in on uh, uh, on electricity prices, mm -hmm. you have a, a small contribution, minimal contribution from the carbon price, which has also increased a lot in percentage terms. But when you look at the actual electricity bill, it's it's peanuts, mm -hmm. and and I think it's often uh, it's often sort of portrayed as this is sort of a, the environmental policies that cost us so, so much and it's sort of easy to 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 use it as a scapegoat but, but if you look at the realities it's more about getting the relative prices right between different ways of producing electricity it's not really about raising raising the cost uh, right. overall mm -hmm. even though you know in the future perhaps this has to um, to an extent, this will perhaps happen if you have to sort of yeah. scrap coal quick, more quickly than than, than you, you then thought, or sorry, than planned, and um, and you have to invest heavily mm. uh, for a period, and you know someone have have to pay this, and it could be reflected on electricity bills. But but I think the evidence so far is not really that um, that the carbon price is 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 making uh, electricity yeah. expensive. Yeah. We have time. Just one last question, perhaps on a social safety net. And I know that um, this roadmap to universal uh, employment insurance by 2025, very ambitious. And so all self-employed workers are supposed to be part of employment insurance. I think the figure was only 0.6% are members now of employment insurance. Well, it's voluntary. And um, given the fact that even employees can escape the employment insurance system, trying to cover self-employed seemed like a huge challenge uh, for the Korean authorities. So how do you think um, this could be done? And given that the voluntary approach has not mm. resulted in significant coverage rates in the mm. in Korea, despite this affordable um, premium rate mm. for, for the self-employed, so the government should consider um, having mandatory employment insurance for the mm. self-employed, as we discussed in the survey. So our mm. key recommendation for this is to make this this, uh, self this uh, insurance for the self-employed as, uh, as mandatory as And mm. um, well, this is the especially important in Korea, where self-employed accounts uh, roughly for, for roughly one quarter of the, of the total mm. workforce, and mm. and most of them are in precarious positions based on relatively low um, survival, business survival rate. So we think that this is very important 
and uh, this has been done in many in some OECD countries like mm -hmm. Slovenia and Luxembourg mm -hmm. and Poland. Mm -hmm. So I think we can, we can Korea can also um, take this approach. Right. I think we've uh, used up our hour, but um, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, talk about your survey and congrat congratulations again on a very outstanding survey that I hope will um, help guide the new UN administration as they uh, make their economic policies. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you thank very you. much.